Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. It's the first Thursday of the month, so we're starting today's program in the kitchen. We're on the cusp of strawberry season, which means other fresh fruits and greens won't be far behind. Here's Marco, who's ready for those first strawberries of the year. Hi, I'm Marco Yella, and I'm here to share another recipe with all of you. And just like everyone else, I am loving this weather. Mother Nature is finally sending us some beautiful temperatures so we can spend some time outside. In this case, I decided to take our recipe segment outdoors, just by Lake Champlain, enjoying this beautiful day. And as the temperatures rise and, you know, we want to be outside, we want to go walking, uh, maybe do some trails, just enjoying the outdoors in this beautiful state that we live in, we also crave fresh food. And one of the first things that I crave during the spring is a salad, a really good fresh salad with local ingredients that I can get not only at my grocery store, local from uh, maybe a farm stand or the farmer's market or even from your own garden. So one of the first fruits that I really enjoy uh, in the spring is strawberries nothing like those sweet juicy vermont strawberries oh my gosh it just makes my mouth water just thinking about it so i wanted to incorporate that fresh fruit into a salad uh, so that's how i found in one of my cookbooks this beautiful salad is a strawberry mandarin orange salad and let me tell you how i put this together first you're gonna take about one pound strawberries, cut the tops off, and cut them into quarters. Then you're gonna take four to five clementine oranges, peel them, and separate them into segments. Set your fruit aside, and now we're ready for the dressing. First, you're gonna take three to four clementine oranges, and you're gonna zest them until you get two tablespoons zest. Now be careful, because you don't want to smash them. Using those same clementines, you're gonna cut them in half and get about four tablespoons juice. To put the dressing together, into a container with a lid, you're gonna add half a cup olive oil. This is from the clementine oranges and lemon. The clementine juice and lemon juice. Half a teaspoon Dijon mustard and half a teaspoon sea salt. Finally, Add two tablespoons honey. In this case, I use maple syrup because everyone loves maple syrup. Then close the container tightly, shake it, and voila, you have the dressing for your salad. And now it's time to assemble the salad. Into a bowl, you're gonna add about 10 ounces mixed green lettuce or fresh spinach. I especially like the spring mix. The part that might be a little time consuming is shelling pistachios. So you're gonna shell enough pistachios to fill three quarters of a cup. To chop them, I found really easy to put them on a plate, put another plate on top of it, and press hard. And just that easily, you have chopped pistachios. You are then going to add your strawberries, the clementine oranges, three quarter cup dried cranberries, and the three quarter cup pistachios. And just like that, your salad is ready to be served. And I have some here, so I'm gonna put it here on my plate so you can see all those beautiful ingredients together. Then you're gonna add your dressing directly onto your salad because you don't want to add it to the whole salad because then it will get soggy and nobody likes soggy salad. And to finish it off, we're gonna sprinkle a little feta cheese, just to balance the sweetness and the tanginess of all of the other ingredients in here. And there you have it, a beautiful salad that is fresh uh, and that everyone in the family is gonna like. So I hope you give this recipe a try. And especially, take the time to be outside and enjoy the outdoors. And now, what will life be without a little dessert, right? So, now that 
we have also all these fresh things. I want to um, show you this dessert that a friend of mine uh, gave me the recipe for, and that's our very own Sharon Meyer from WCAX, who served this Impossible Pie. And I know that a lot of you enjoy Impossible Pies because they are so easy to make, and as, they're, as the name said, they're impossibly easy to put together. So let me tell you how I put this together. First, you're gonna peel four apples. You can use whatever apple you like for baking. I personally like mixing my apples to get a more complex recipe out of it. Once your apples are peeled, you're gonna cut them into big slices. Then, in a bowl, you're gonna mix your apples with one tablespoon sugar and one teaspoon cinnamon. Then give them a good tossing until all the apples are covered. Then, for the dough for your impossible pie, to a bowl you're gonna add one beaten egg, one cup sugar, one cup flour, half a cup the nuts of your preference. I use almonds for this recipe. Finally, you're gonna add three quarters of a cup melted butter. Then, carefully fold all your ingredients until a dough forms. This dough is going to be nice and flexible. Next, spray a deep pie dish with cooking spray. Add your apples and spread the dough over them. As you can see, Rudy was on guard when I put the pie into the oven at 350 degrees for 40 minutes. And he was there until the pie was ready to come out. And you can see how beautifully golden it is and how the juices are bubbly. And I really hope you give this recipe a try because it is wonderful. And also, try this, try this salad because it makes a great side dish that you can add some um, chicken or some pork to to make it a main dish. So remember, you can always make recipes your own. And while you're at it, also remember to follow Across the Fence on social media, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest updates of Across the Fence right in your phone or your computer and follow us on Twitter. And from my kitchen, or in this case, from the outdoors to your kitchen, happy cooking. Thank you, Marco. And a reminder that you can find our recipe archives on the Across the Fence website. The archives go back more than a decade, so you'll find plenty of menu choices. Our next segment focuses on Vermont's Civil War history. In cities and towns all across the state, there are monuments and other memorials that bear the names of those who died in that war. A few years ago, historian Howard Coffin took us on a tour to commemorate the fallen soldiers. Here's Howard. The towns that were hit hardest by the Civil War here in Vermont erected the first memorials. Here in Derby Line, this monument was erected on October 31st, 1866. Two speakers at the dedication, Josiah Grout, veteran of the Vermont Cavalry, soon to be governor, and a man named B.H. Steele who said, 53 of the soldiers of our town lost their lives in the great work, and such lives, young, ardent, promising lives, around which clustered our fond hopes and tender aspirations. The monument has a plaque listing the names of all the soldiers from Derby who served. There are stars beside the names of those who died. There are many stars. One of Vermont's most intricate Civil War memorial stands here on the green in Coventry, dedicated in 1912, and made not of stone, but of metal. It has the likenesses of George Dewey, the hero of Manila Bay who won a Medal of Honor in the Civil War at Vicksburg, of Abraham Lincoln and George Jerison Stannard, heroes of Gettysburg, and of Ulysses Grant. It also has the names of major battles. And there's a quotation 
on this monument that I like. It is a rough land of rock and stone and tree, where it breathes no castle lord nor cabin slave, where thoughts and hands and tongues are free, and friends will find a welcome, foes a grave. Brattleboro's Civil War monument on the north side of the village in the town common is one of Vermont's finest. Atop it, a Union soldier looks south toward the old battlefields. The monument is from a grateful town honoring the 385 Brattleboro men who served. It includes a plaque bearing the state seal, a list of many of the major battles in which Vermonters fought, and also there are the healing words of Lincoln from the second inaugural address, with malice toward none, with charity to all. Woodstock honored its 289 veterans by putting an eagle-topped monument by the village school. Years went by and the veterans decided it wasn't adequate. So they put up a new one in Tribu Park on the east end of town. It was dedicated on Memorial Day, 1909. 1,500 people were present to see 30 young women in white dresses pull the flag off the great edifice while the old veterans gave three cheers and a tiger. Rawr. The monument honored Woodstock soldiers who had fought from Big Bethel to Appomattox, Big Bethel being the first battle of the war in which Woodstock troops had fought. The Woodstock monument faces due east. Vermont monuments to the Civil War face in any direction, north, south, east, and west. Confederate monuments almost all face north so as not to have their backs to the Yankees. But the Union won the war. Vermonters didn't care which way they looked. Thank you, Howard. And once again, thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard, stay well.